you again. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, great to see you, Chris. Thanks, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, Sam, before we get into the specifics of, of Silo and uh, your particular focus and approach to drug development, um, maybe you can just share a little bit in terms of your own background, your education, your professional experience, and, and how it is you got interested in, in psychedelic medicine. Yeah, yeah, sure, Chris. Um, so, so I'm a chemist by training, um, and I, I did my undergraduate studies in Australia, and that's that's sort of where I, um, at the University of Sydney, where I really just fell in love with organic chemistry. So um, I'd, I'd been interested in or thinking since I was a teenager about how to have impact w- with a career and um, and realize that, you know, drug development is one of these areas where you can put your mind to work on, um, you know, on a piece of technology that can potentially impact, you know, a billion or more people. Um, so so really was pretty interested in, in drug development from very, very early on. Um, ended up uh, doing a postdoc, a PhD in Australia, and then that took me to a postdoc at, at Stanford, and that was really focused on um, developing new uh, radio traces for for brain inflammation. Um, so it's a super cool technology where you have radioactive isotopes attached to a, a a tracer molecule, and and you know that got rolled out through a number of university linked hospitals in the US, um, looking at things like um, you know traumatic brain injuries and um, and other you know pretty serious. Uh, issues with the brain. Uh, I stuck around Stanford for a little bit doing some structure-based drug design, um, collaborating with, with Brian Kabilka's lab, um, looking at designing really functionally selective drugs that sort of induce a particular conformation of a, of a protein for therapeutic effect. Um, and then in my final year there, I ended up working with Ed Engelman's lab um, and Mark Smith at, at ChemH, which is a big translational uh, medicine center there. And that was on a new signaling pathway that's relevant to uh, neurodegenerative diseases broadly. And, and that spun out into a company called Tranquist Therapeutics. Um, and they're looking to take one of these assets into um, a phase two trial for ALS, um, which was you know very relevant. I had a friend um, whose dad was, was dying of ALS at the time, so I had a, a pretty personal connection there. Uh, and then I was recruited back to Australia to do um, drug development, head up a drug development initiative at the University of Sydney um, at the Brain and Mind Center focused most, mostly on pediatric epilepsies um, and, and natural products derived from cannabis. Uh, so as I was wrapping up that position, you know, I'd sort of decided that, that after spending a few years in the Bay, um, yeah, the, the pace of academic life was, was not really what I was looking for and, and got super interested in, um, you know, starting a company and, and thinking about what was happening in, in the psychedelic space at the time. And I'd, you know, I've lost a number of friends to suicide since I was a teenager. Um, and sort of right around the time we were kicking silo off, I, I lost a very close friend um, to suicide that year. So, you know, things, things became a bit more urgent. Um, and we just started working uh, even harder on, on building this thing. And so that, that would have been, uh, when, uh, about when that you, you, uh, you started thinking about psychedelics in terms of setting up a company? Uh, so this was sort of during, just after the pandemic. Um, okay. so yeah, so it's a sort of, uh, 2020, 2021, I've been watching the space pretty closely. Um, I'd have been interested in psychedelics beyond traditional drug development um, for, for quite a while. So um, it, I'm sure there's probably other listeners who, who may have had similar experiences, but my, my introduction to psychedelics was fairly non-traditional um, in that I, I was at Dimmick's Bookstore in Sydney, which is just a, a very large um, old bookstore in, in the center of the city, and actually looking for sort of sci-fi and fantasy novels at the age of 15 or so and stumbled upon um, in that same section of the bookstore in the basement, um, a, a book called Quantum Psychology by Robert Anton Wilson. And I've, I've since met a number of other people working in this field who, um, who are also familiar with, with Robert Anton Wilson. Um, but he's essentially, he describes himself as a guerrilla ontologist. So um, he, he had these sort of workbooks on how to think about uh, reality and, and the subjective nature of reality. And I've you know, been reading a lot of Buddhist literature and, and sort of discovered Leary and, and psychedelics that way um, and just became really curious at that point. Uh, you know, with something like LSD, where you can take a hundred micrograms, you know, this tiny yeah. fraction of a milligram, and have such a profound effect on, you know, basically all of human experience, uh, and that just sort of really kindled my interest in in this particular area. There, there often seems to be a, a book in most people's origin story when it comes to interest in psychedelics. Uh, yeah, for me, it was. Uh, uh... Tom Wolf's electric Kool Aid acid test at yeah. the age of fourteen, <laughs> which slightly different intro, but uh, but nonetheless piqued uh, piqued my interest at an early age. Um, uh, great. So 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 um, Silo is is you know fairly recent in terms of existence. You said two thousand twenty two thousand twenty one. Um, you know how did you get together with your co founder Josh and 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 decide on the particular focus of the company? Because obviously a lot was going on by this point. A number of companies starting to get active in the space. I think 2021 was sort of really the peak 
uh, on the yeah. financing side, which we'll return to. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it was really a bit fortuitous. Um, Josh, Josh is a, a super interesting guy who um, he'd been a, a repeat founder in, in the tech space. Um, was looking to do something a bit more impactful with, with his particular skill set. Um, had been an angel investor in a number of different uh, sort of synthetic biology companies in, in the old protein space in Australia. Uh, and he was really just sort of scouting around universities. So, um, yeah, he, his wife uh, worked at University of Sydney at the time um, and, and um, ran sort of a knowledge center and incubation space. Uh, and that's how we met. And, and we really just sort of hit it off. So we um, we sort of bonded over uh, Michael Pollan, who, uh, you know, this is before How to Change Your Mind. I'd read a, a number yeah. of his books, including Botany of Desire. Um, you know, Josh, yeah, Josh and I just had a pretty similar worldview. Um, you know, he, he was sort of curious about the effective altruism movement. Um, he was, you know, sort of an environmental vegetarian. Uh, yeah, we just had a, a really sort of similarly aligned worldview. So um, he, he's a New Yorker originally. Uh, so, you know, when I first met him, I, I just really liked his, his sort of hustle. And uh, he seemed like yeah, exactly the sort of person who, you know, who I could build a company with. Nice. So uh, maybe we can t- talk a little bit about um, Silo's focus. Um, you know, the last few years have been interesting. We've seen this sort of evolution in, in the drug development space when it comes to psychedelics. You know, very early on, the focus, uh, both in terms of drug development and the media on, on sort of Gen 1 classic psychedelics. And then a number of companies uh, focusing on developing Gen 2 psychedelics. So, you know, altering the, the length of the trip, typically shortening it, but not always, or trying to optimize it in other ways to improve efficacy, safety, and, and in particular, tolerability. And now we've seen uh, an increasing focus on Gen 3 psychedelics, where uh, companies are attempting to remove the hallucinogenic uh, experience entirely um, from the drugs with the prospect of creating treatments that patients could theoretically take home. Uh, you guys appear to have your, your feet planted in several camps. You've got uh, Silo 300X, which is described as a hallucinogenic, unidentified in terms of the, the um, psychedelic that's inspired it. You've got Silo 400X, which is described as less hallucinogenic, and uh, Silo 100 and 500X, which are non-hallucinogenic. Is this a, a reflection of the fact that, um, you know, the jury's sort of still out on which model is going to work best, uh, you know, a, a way of de-risking your portfolio? Or do you, do you see uh, an application for all three generations of psychedelics in terms of um, potential medical uh, models and pathways as to how we introduce these drugs as, as, as treatments? Yeah, yeah, it's a really, really good question, um, and, and we are we're, we're a little bit unusual in that we're hedged across several different sort of modalities of, of therapeutic treatment here. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think there'll be a place for all of these different products, and, and that's sort of one of these uh, really interesting arguments um, in the field at the moment around uh, you know sort of corporatization of psychedelics as if as if this will be a binary sort of um, either or sort of situation. But I actually think there'll be uh, a number of different um, sort of commercial markets for these products and, and for patients who need them. So, yeah, we, we were interested in uh, in developing compounds across a number of different classes. Um, and part of the rationale for that is um, this compromise between sort of immediate uh, commercial and patient need and, and sort of, um, you know, more blue sky ambition in terms of the sorts of products that can ultimately be developed in this field, given the current state of the science. Uh, so we started out working on sort of shorter acting tryptamine analogs, so things that are, fall within the 300X series. And, and the reasoning there is that, you know, uh, psilocybin um, and, and other psychedelics are clearly effective under the sort of assisted psychotherapy model, um, but they're not going to be broadly deployable because of this uh, sort of resource intensive nature of that therapy. The fact that you need under the current model, you know, two therapists, these very long treatment windows, it, it's going to be sort of a almost a luxury good for a lot of patients, I think. It's a lot of questions around beyond rollout, around reimbursement and other things. It's a very unusual sort of model of drug. Um, 400X we, we classify as less hallucinogenic, and this is based on um, the particular profile of this class of drug in the head twitch response. So we have a, a series of compounds that um, seem to be somewhere between these, these truly sort of non-hallucinogenic compounds and, and fully hallucinogenic agents. Um, and the interesting use case there, uh, where a lot of the clinical data is still pending, um, is in, you know, although I don't really like the term, but in the sort of microdosing type application, so subperceptual dosing of some of these compounds. And, and there are a number of really interesting studies going on at the moment that are, you know, to the extent that they can be randomized, placebo controlled, 
um, one being run by Vince uh, Polito in Australia, looking at you know, five milligrams of psilocybin several times a week for, for young males with moderate depression. So um, there's a possibility that maybe you don't need a fully intensive, um, you know, mystical sort of dose of psilocybin to get the same sorts of effects in other indications. And that's really where, where the 400X um, series is sort of intended for development. Um, and then finally, we have, we have 100X and 500X, which have different starting points, but are both, um, you know, non-hallucinogenic 5-HT, 2A preferring agonists. Um, and, and obviously, this has the broadest um, therapeutic potential, you know, if they work in the clinic, uh, because there'll be a number of people who are just contraindicated or, or unwilling um, to go through psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So if we can retain some of the same therapeutic benefits of these, these psychedelic compounds um, without uh, such an intense subjective experience, um, you have a, a you know a medicine that can essentially be take home and, and be used maybe in a broader range of indications as well. Yeah, and and uh, I'll, I'd like to return to the de the debate a little bit because I think it's an interesting one and sort of spans um, questions of both therapeutic uh, efficacy and and ethics. As you know, um, I'm sure you've been following it closely. Um, I, I I also agree that I think there will be you know uh, different applications for different um, types of of compounds. Where, where do you see particular compounds having the potential sort of greatest role? I mean, for uh, classic psychedelics, you know, you could see maybe people with end of life anxiety or or existential distress where they would benefit from a full blown psychedelic experience in the the, you know, the personal meaning and insightfulness that would come with that, even if it didn't have a, a necessary, a, a direct therapeutic benefit that you could get with neuroplasticity alone. And then, you know, things like maybe generalized anxiety disorder, maybe the mystic type experience isn't, isn't as important to treating patients. Uh, we'll obviously see, but, you know, how do you potentially see it breaking down in terms of indication for mm -hmm. indications where the, the various classes are going to be uh, potentially most useful? Yeah, it's it's things are evolving um, pretty quickly in this space. So you know, all of the early signals, um, historically, a more recent work by Roland Griffiths and others, um, you know, we're seeing good efficacy with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, in various forms of depression. So so major depressive disorder, treatment resistant depression, um, some trials reporting um, good results with generalized anxiety disorder. Um, substance use disorder is an area of historical interest and, and a lot of the work around sort of smoking cessation has been um, repeated in recent years uh, and that's now expanding into other areas of addiction. So there's um, studies in, in Australia, for example, looking at um, methamphetamine use disorder um, as well as alcoholism, opioid use disorder elsewhere. Um, but do you, do, you, sir, do, do, you see, do you see any of those as, as uh, indications where uh, there may be a particular need for a, a longer more acute psychedelic experience versus something that's, you know, less hallucinogenic or non hallucinogenic, or do you think the jury is entirely still out as to whether you can treat say treatment resistant depression uh, or anxiety or, you know, even substance use disorder with something that's, you know, less hallucinogenic or non hallucinogenic. Yeah. I, I think the jury is still out on, on all of this, right? So there's a yeah. there's sort of mounting evidence, um, based on a lot of the work done uh, and sort of reported by Roland Griffiths and, and David Yadin looking at um, the extent to which the subjective experience and, and there's sort of um, two different aspects to it. So there's the, you know, the mystical type experience associated with psychedelics that seems to be uh, somewhat delineated even from just the subjective intensity of the experience overall. Yeah. Uh, and both of these things independently seem to correlate with um, therapeutic benefit, uh, both acutely and, and in terms of enduring effects um, across a number of different indications. Um, so I think for a lot of psychiatric illnesses, it's, it's sort of unclear at this point until we start seeing clinical trials reporting um, efficacy data around some of these non-hallucinogenic agents, um, whether you can achieve the same effects with, without the trip, as it were. Um, but then I think there are other sort of interesting applications emerging in, in neurology, uh, you know, based on, on rat data um, and stroke recovery models, sorry, stroke models and, and stroke recovery with DMT. Um, there are now clinical trials being initiated from, from those sorts of preclinical data. Um, so I would argue that's, that's one particular case, for example, where you, you probably don't need a DMT trip if you're recovering from some, you know, really traumatic stroke and, and just seeking yeah. uh, neurological benefits. So, yeah, I think there will absolutely be, be different um, use cases for these compounds. Um, it's just unclear to, to what extent in psychiatry specifically, um, you know, mood disorders and other things that the non-hallucinogenic sort of two-way agonist will be useful. Yeah, you sort of have this behavioral catalyst model versus a very neurobiological focused model. 
Um, yeah. In, you know, uh, what about sort of the ethical debate around this? As, as you know, um, uh, Roland Griffiths and Brian Earp and David Yaden uh, uh, published uh, a piece in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics. Uh, I think David Olson also published a piece in the, in the same journal. Uh, and there was some debate around the ethics of um, hallucinogenics versus non-hallucinogenics with um, Griffiths and, and Earp and, and Yadin arguing that, um, you know, psychedelics should really be the, the default treatment uh, for patients, uh, except for in those cases where, you know, they're contraindicated or where they would be counter therapeutic for whatever reason, you know, particularly vulnerable patients, perhaps. Um, and, and others arguing that, um, you know, really there's, there's more important drivers here in terms of scalability and cost and other factors to consider in terms of which path we go down. If, if there is in fact, um, efficacy, you know, similar efficacy for both types of, of, uh, of psychedelics. Any thoughts on, on this particular debate? Yeah, it's, it's been a a fun debate to follow. There's, I think, yeah, you're referring to the, um, the, the 2020 issue of, of ACS pharmacology and translational science. So you have these, these two articles right next to each other, these viewpoints and ones, you know, from Yaden and Griffiths, um, the subjective effects of psychedelics are necessary for their enduring therapeutic effects. Uh, and then one from Dave Olson, you know, right next to it, that the subjective effects of psychedelics may not be necessary for their enduring therapeutic effects. Um, so, so it's clearly, you know, even among sort of key opinion leaders in the field, this is very much a, a topic of debate. Um, from, from an ethics standpoint, um, yeah, I, I really just don't think we have enough data on, uh, you know, the sort of non-hallucinogenic compounds within this class to make those sorts of determinations. Um, so I, I think the reality is beyond any ethical consideration, there are just people who, who won't want to have a psychedelic experience um, or are contraindicated because of other comorbidities, um, family history of, of psychosis or other things. Um, the, you know, these are pretty challenging experiences for a lot of people. If you speak to participants in, in some of these trials, um, you know, the, they're not without risk that the, there are sort of adverse events reported from these trials as well. Um, so if we can see good efficacy uh, for any given indication for some of these non-hallucinogenic agents, um, you know, I, I absolutely think they they will have value beyond whatever else is happening with psychedelic assisted therapy. Yeah. And, and you know, beyond the consideration of, of uh, cost and lack of reimbursement, there's obviously a question of scalability. As, as you know, Compass has just signed or announced two partnerships, one with Green Book, uh, Green Book uh, TMS and another with um, Hackensack Meridian Health, where they're, you know, investigating and researching and trying to develop uh, delivery models for Compass 360, presuming it, it gets uh, approved and presumably those partnerships will give them access to, you know, a, a large number of clinics where they can delev- deliver these. Uh, I know that uh, Lycos, formerly MAPS PBC, is really very much focused on developing training models for, um, for therapists in order to be able to deliver uh, uh, MDMA uh, assisted therapy, uh, presuming there's approval next year. So there seems to be a real issue in terms of not just cost, but you know how we get these treatments into the hands of large number of patients, given the lack of of trained therapists and the lack of psychotherapists generally. Um, do, you, do you think there's enough happening on that front to build the infrastructure and, and train the therapists in the event that it turns out that you know? Um, the full psycho, uh, psychedelic experience is required for, you know, particular patients in particular indications, or, you know, how do you see that evolving over the next few years? It seems like there's a, a pretty long road ahead in terms of getting to where we'd need to be and training up, you know, theoretically, you know, tens of thousands of therapists in order mm. to deliver patients to a large, uh, deliver therapies to a large population of patients who are in need of better, better treatment options. Yeah, it, it's sort of a, a huge elephant in the room. So, so other aspects of um, from concierge medicine and, and sort of um, clinical delivery of different drugs, you know, many oncology products, for example, are delivered in clinics. So that, that aspect of having patients come to a site for, you know, specific administration of a, a therapeutic agent and be treated there, um, you know, some of those sorts of technicalities have already been demonstrated in other areas. But, but yeah, the, the big question is really around, um, you know, how we how we have enough therapists to actually be delivering um, delivering these therapeutics under the sort of uh, model that's being uh, developed at the moment. Um, you, you've got various groups looking at, uh, you know, ways to sort of reduce therapist need uh, in terms of sort of group therapy sessions yeah. following acute dosing with psilocybin. So I think people are, are getting pretty creative about um, how we can reduce this sort of pretty obvious barrier to, to broader deployment. Um, 
I know that MAPS and some other groups are really proactive on um, training up therapists, which is sort of historically, which is also sort of interesting for a, a therapeutic uh, product and modality that, that doesn't necessarily exist right now and, and may not exist in future, although I think it's likely that it will. Um, but yeah, given the waiting times we have, you know, in the US, in parts of Europe, in, in Australia and New Zealand as well, for psychiatrists generally, for psychotherapists, um, yeah, I, I don't see this as being, you know, something that'll be resolved uh, in, in, along the timelines that are needed for this to be sort of a broadly accessible treatment for the numbers of patients who are going to need it. So I think that that is probably the largest barrier in my mind um, to the broad deployment uh, of these therapeutics beyond any considerations of reimbursement or anything else. So, so how, how, do, how do you think that looks for the rollout of, of MAPS uh, or Lycos's uh, MDMA-assisted therapy and Compass 360? Is the reality that in the early years, a lot of patients simply are not going to be able to access these treatments, leaving aside questions of cost and reimbursement, uh, just in terms of l lack of trained therapists and, and infrastructure to some degree? Yeah, I, I think that's probably exactly the case. These are going to be very hard to access treatments. Um, and, and, you know, those needs will be met in some cases, at least in the US, under various state models. So um, these sort of initiatives that have been approved in, in Colorado and Oregon at the moment for, uh, you know, either non-therapeutic or sort of uh, pseudo-therapeutic um, treatment with, with psilocybin, um, but those sorts of state level initiatives um, are in conflict with um, you know various FDA processes around um, you know marketing and, and uh, delivery of, of therapeutic services. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be pretty hard for for a lot of people to access these treatments in the early years, at least. Um. Well, hopefully progress is made. Obviously, um, you know, significant time and effort has been invested by by MAPS and those folks in getting MDMA-assisted therapy over the line. It would be an unfortunate if uh, if it doesn't get into the hands enough of enough uh, patients. Now, having said that, obviously, it's going to be a huge catalyst for the space in terms of um, uh, investment and further research and in, in integrating psychedelics into existing medical models. But um, but there's obviously a huge number of patients with with uh, with a need. In terms of um, non-hallucinogenics, um, what are your expectations around um, psych you know, psychoactive profiles of these? As you may have seen, there's sort of been some recent trip reports regarding uh, uh, tabernanthalog or T TBG as, uh, as Olson's uh, named it, which is a 5-AMEO analog uh, developed by uh, David Olson and his colleagues at UC Davis. And some folks have sort of gone out and synthesized this on their own and and self-administered and you know while um tests in the lab showed not to be a psychedelic based on head twitched response tests and rodents it would appear that you know based on some of these chip reports it does have what's been described as dissociative or or other effects um you know anxiolytic or almost a meditative effect w what's the expectation in terms of your non-hallucinogenic compounds do you know at this point or is you know is this something that has to be determined uh, once you get further into your development program. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been following some of these reports online, um, you know, and I just finished reading Psychonauts by by Mike Jay, which covers sort of the history of self-experimentation, which I think is um, probably more relevant now than ever. And, yeah. you know, I, I think the idea of self-experimentation in this space, it's sort of a, an open secret. There are a number of companies where self-experimentation with these pre-approved products uh, does take place. Um, Silos, we're not one of those companies, so I can't really speak to the sort of subjective profile of, of any of our 100X compounds, for example. Um, but speaking to other scientists in the space, um, one of the remarkable things about the head twitch response is that it's often quoted as having um, very few false positives. So there are a number of sort of serotonin adjacent molecules that will induce a head twitch response that are not psychedelic in humans. But generally, most of the compounds that have been assessed in, in head twitch in rodents um, are psychedelic in humans, and we can correlate the two. Um, that said, they're from a relatively narrow sort of diversity of chemical space. So they fall into just a couple of different chemical classes, um, all of those compounds that have been explored. And it's often stated that there are no false negatives known at this point. Um, but speaking to scientists, you know, who are, are pretty deeply knowledgeable in this area, um, there is apparently a little bit of a, a disconnect between head twitch response and some of these sort of emerging low efficacy 2A preferring agonists, for example. So um, I, I've been told by, by several people that um, there are compounds that do have a, a noticeable psychoactive effect at various doses, not, not psychedelic, but psychoactive. Um, that you know fail to give you a, a head twitch response, and there are others that have no discernible subjective effect that do give you a, a readout in the head twitch response. So I think as as the field matures, uh, I think we will see that 
uh, you know, maybe head twitch response is not as entirely predictive as it's sort of made out to be, um, or that it doesn't pick up on um, all of the sort of subjective profiles of some of these drugs. Uh, but yeah, I think the only the only way to get to the bottom of, of the subjective profiles of these drugs is really to, um, you know, use various questionnaires and surveys in the sort of phase one studies where you're looking at safety and tolerability. And I, I think what we'll find is that, um, you know, these compounds can be discerned from a placebo and they do have some sort of subjective profile, um, even if it's not a, a fully psychedelic effect as such. Um, and yeah, that's, that's certainly what people are um, suggesting in, in Reddit posts and, not, and elsewhere with, um, you know, self-experimentation with some of these substances. Um, and as someone who used to work in sort of on the forensic end of new psychoactive substances, there are a lot of caveats there as well. So, um, you yeah, know, sure. we, we don't know if someone states that they synthesized or purchased some TBG, what was the actual um, identity of that material? What was its purity? You know, they're all... Uh, other issues around sort of veracity of these claims, but I think the only way to really know is is to dose people in a phase one study and have them self-report on on the experience. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how many of these uh, these drug candidates develop. W- what can you tell us about where uh, Silo is in in terms of its development program? How how far along are you? What you know? What are the upcoming milestones in terms of the various assets in your portfolio? I know you're you're not. Um, divulging at this point the indications that you're focused on but but nonetheless it'd be interesting to know sort of where you are and what what the you know the near to uh midterm sort of future holds in terms of that that pro those programs yeah um yeah so, so our most advanced asset class is is the 100x series um and we had a, a pretty exciting um series of experiments concluded late last year um so our general hypothesis in this area is that um and we've demonstrated this that you can generate uh, potent, efficacious 5-HT2A preferring agonists um, that are negative in, in the head twitch response in, in mice, um, but do give you positive readouts in a number of behavioral assays that do induce neuroplasticity in neurons. Um, we've actually shown across our compound series, so everything from the 300X fully hallucinogenic series to the sort of um, partially hallucinogenic 400X and 100X that we do get these sort of um, neuroplasticity type changes in um, in cultured neurons. Um, so we think you can absolutely sort of delineate um, the head twitch response from likely um, sort of neurobiological changes and, and their potential therapeutic effects. Um, so the 100X series is, is the most advanced. Um, we've gone as far as fully characterizing what we're thinking about as a, a clinical lead there. Um, and we're in the process now of doing uh, all of the required sort of non-clinical safety work with a view to entering uh, pre-IND studies by um, Q2 of this year. Um, so we've, we've shown that, yeah, the, the profile of this compound is as expected based on our hypothesis that 2A is extremely important for the therapeutic effects. Um, we've got as far as uh, doing sort of PKPD assessment to show that we do reach um, good concentrations of the unbound drug in the brain of a living, mi- uh, living mouse uh, in the cortex, which is where we think a lot of a lot of the action is. Um, so we've, yeah, we've got a really promising um, looking compound from that series and, and several backups in case we hit any flags in the, um, you know, the non-clinical safety work. And, and then uh, when do you expect to move into sort of later stages in terms of your drug development, presuming you don't hit any red flags uh, as the program develops? We're aiming to have all of the um, IND enabling work completed by the end of this year, and, and that would put us in a really good position to move into first in human studies um, by 2025. Okay. And and um, you you guys um, talk a little bit about your uh, co- uh, computational chemistry approach to drug development. Obviously, computer assisted drug development's been around since I think the early 1980s. Fortune magazine reported on. You know, Merck using computers to design drugs at the time. This was a big uh, revolution in, in drug development. Obviously, things have come a long way since then, uh, particularly with the development of more sophisticated algorithms and 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 AI. Um, how, how are you? How are you using it? Uh, you know, to develop your particular assets. Uh, is it different than? You know, what other companies might t- typically do. I know there's, you know, structure assisted drug development and there's ligand assisted drug development and in many different approaches. So, you know, um, you, could you speak to sort of how, how you're uh, approaching this to design your particular assets? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's obviously a super, super interesting area with all the, the hype around uh, AI and, uh, and, and ML. And I think, yeah, it's probably a number of, of pitch decks that feature these throughout <laughs> at the moment, just because it is so topical and, and there's so much buzz. Um, the reality is for, you know, and I'm always a bit of a skeptic in this area, um, purely because 
uh, so far to date, sort of AI-assisted drug development hasn't really delivered anything truly novel. So you have companies um, like Atomwise that have had, you know, over 100 partnerships, I think, at this point, um, and are now sort of developing their own assets. Um, and, and companies like Exientia, who've developed a number of different drugs. But, you know, when you look at, at, at under the hood at the details of these, they're really sort of um, analogs of existing drugs that target known mechanisms. So I think this sort of idea that, you know, AI is absolutely going to revolutionize drug development is, is a bit of a stretch. Um, and, and the main reason for this is just that, you know, um, development of new chemical matter is no longer the barrier. Like the biggest barrier to development of innovative medicines is, is efficacy in phase two studies. That's where a lot of things fall down. Um, I, but I think there is value in sort of some parts of the drug development process. Uh, and to that end, you know, we, we've developed our own platform um, that we're terming in Silico. Um, it, it enables us to do a number of different things. So we have a, a bit of a software stack that allows us to do um, aspects of sort of uh, physicochemical property um, mapping for different compounds and, and predictions based on that so that we don't bother synthesizing drugs that we think are unlikely to be successful. Um, but beyond that, it's also, you know, one of the sort of... Um, key elements of, of this platform that we've built is that we have a, a really nice proprietary structure for the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, this is the main receptor for psychedelic activity, and we would argue for therapeutic activity. Uh, obviously, a lot of focus on that from structural biologists in the last few years. So you had um, cryo-EM structures appearing with various ligands, Dr. 2A, and then this super exciting preprint from Brian Roth and colleagues um, recently showing that AlphaFold2, which is a technology that was not very good um, you know, historically, is now capable of, at least in some cases, generating these really uh, interesting structures, and that there's actually a bit of a, a disconnect between the cryo EM structures and the alpha fold two structures for two A in terms of the chemical matter that you can discover. So, um, you know, they've they've done a bunch of docking, shown that you get completely different chemical starting points from those docking campaigns depending on what structure you use. Um, so we we were doing this right at the inception of the company, taking the a known two A structure looking at our um, structure activity relationships across all of the compounds we've designed, um, refining that 2A structure so that it's now sort of a, a proprietary um, structure for the target protein. Uh, and we've actually done our own docking campaign of, of several hundred million compounds against that to discover some new chemical matter. So um, our 500X series, for example, actually comes directly from that, um, that docking campaign. And we've done a, a whole bunch of exploratory structure activity work to show that this is um, you know, a real experimentally validated finding um, that's formed the basis of a, a some super interesting chemical development um, in terms of a new lead series. So, yeah, I think for certain aspects of development, um, there's there's absolutely utility in um, in a lot of these computational approaches. Uh, and we're partnered with uh, Professor Jess Holian's lab at RMIT to to develop this platform further through a, a co-sponsored PhD program. And obviously, significant savings in terms of of time and investment, right? I mean, I think people fail to realize how much money is spent at the early phase of sort of drug development. You know, people typically think about the, the clinical trial process as the, as the, you know, where all the money is spent, but, but really a big investment is on the front end, is it not? And you, know, you can save significantly with these, these con computer assisted uh, drug development approaches in terms of you said 200 million uh, uh, compounds are screened. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we, we docked more than 100 million compounds um, at our 2A yeah. structure. We, we got a decent hit rate. You know, we identified about 1,400 bits of chemical matter. Um, and of those, you know, about 600 are likely agonists and, and the rest are likely antagonists. And we went on to experimentally validate several series from, from within those. Um, and, you know, the benefit of doing it computationally is that um, we'd already done, uh, using the same platform, we'd already... Uh, mapped aspects of the sort of physicochemical properties of some of these likely um, hits. Um, so we can sort of, you know, discard compounds that we think are less promising and, and only focus on ones that we think have a, a chance of going somewhere. Uh, and then you can start, you know, focusing on doing some of the um, preliminary uh, in vitro admit assessments to work out, you know, which of these several series is actually the most promising for, for future development. So, yeah, I think it's a really good way to select um, really good chemical matter from, from stuff that's um, less useful. Yeah. Um, in June of last year, you guys announced um, a um, sponsored research deal with uh, Daichi Sanko, which is Japan's second largest pharmaceutical company. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, what it, what it brings to the, the table and the significance of it for, for your drug development program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've signed a, a sponsored research agreement with Daichi Sanko, which is um, yeah, su super interesting because they're predominantly an oncology company. Um, you know, it obviously means that they're watching developments in this space and, and maybe in neuroscience more broadly. Um, under 
various sort of confidentiality clause of that agreement. There's, there's not a whole lot I, I can say, um, except that, you know, it, it gives Daiichi uh, good insight into our, our scientific program. And um, yeah, it's been a really great relationship so far. So um, we've, we've met regularly um, with various members of, of Daiichi's sort of newer R&D team. Um, and, and they're obviously super interested in, in these, um, especially non-hallucinogenic compounds that are capable of, of modifying the brain in various ways that might be therapeutic. You know, this is this is fairly unique in terms of um, big pharma's interest in psychedelics. You know, obviously there was the uh, Otsuka purchase of uh, Mindset Pharma last year, and I think Otsuka also invested uh, has in, uh, partnered with Atai and invested in Compass. Um, but other than that, there's not been a lot of activity from big pharma. You think it, you know is that ind indicative of the fact that so many companies are really early in you know the development uh, in the development programs at this stage? Um, and that farm is sort of waiting to see before jumping in. Do you think it's other factors? Um, you know, some of these considerations we discussed earlier around the difficulty of bringing, you know, um, uh, compounds with acute uh, psychedelic effects uh, to market in terms of, you know, um, the rollout and scalability of these medicines. You know, what do you think exactly is sort of going on here? And do you expect that to change in the short to midterm? Yeah, it's a, it's a super interesting development. I think um, I think everyone was a little bit surprised by the the sort of Otsuka announcement with, with the acquisition of Mindset. Um, I, I think there are a number, you know, I think pharma generally are pretty conservative. Um, the idea of psychoactive drugs presents some sort of, um, if nothing else, a little bit of cultural stigma. And I think, uh, you, you know, it's an area that, that people would rather avoid if they can. Um, I, I think Spravato has to some extent played a role in, um, you know, sort of allaying uh, fears and concerns in, in the, the sector broadly. Um, so the idea that you'd have a, a sort of, to any extent, psychoactive substance, um, you know, now approaching sort of a billion dollar drug status. Yeah, I was going to um, say. I, yeah, I, I think that would... Yeah, this year, I think it's a billion bucks they're expecting, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that wasn't entirely predictable. And I think a lot of people were probably skeptical that that would happen. But, you know, that, that sort of acts as a bit of a bellwether for, um, you know, tolerability of this idea of, of psychoactive substances having, um, you know, therapeutic utility and being sort of commercially viable. Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, pharma pipelines are coming up to a, a number of challenges over the next decade, so that there is a bit of a, a patent cliff, um, something like 190 drugs um, expected to lose exclusivity by 2030, and um, I think almost 70 blockbusters in that set. So um, pharma pipelines are, you know, uh, are a little bit thin at the moment. And I think psychiatry specifically is one of these areas where, you know, many companies based on, on big failures in Alzheimer's and, and other areas of neurology, um, many of the bigger players have divested themselves of sort of um, internal R&D efforts in psychiatry because it's just a, a super challenging area. So I think, you know, the, the way to refill those pipelines is, is through sort of M&A activity and, um, you know, acquiring later stage companies that have shown sort of good, uh, good clinical efficacy data phase two and beyond. Um, you know, we're seeing the, the beginnings of this already um, with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb acquiring Karuna at the end of last year, you know, with their focus on, on M1, M4 um, modulators for, for schizophrenia. Um, uh, what else happened? I think you had AbbVie acquisition of Cerebral, another sort of neuroscience focused company also interested in um, in schizophrenia. So I think I think we'll see more of this sort of activity, um, larger M&A activities from big pharma players in, you know, non-psychedelic areas of neuroscience and i think that will then expand into areas of sort of psychedelics once you know people can can satisfy themselves that there's real opportunity here and real benefit yeah there's been i mean they, they've invested little over the last 30 years as, as you as you know um so certainly this is a this is a uh, would be theoretically an easy path to, to start filling their their pipelines in this area um do you think the psychotherapy component it plays has played um a role at all in terms of um, the reticence of some of these companies maybe to jump in early. This is obviously something they're not typically used to dealing with. They develop drugs, you give patient drugs, the, the drug, and, and, and that's sort of the story, right? Um, it's sort of a model they don't necessarily particularly understand or attracted to, I, I would presume as well. Yeah, I think that's probably part of it. It's a little bit unusual, you know, as we discussed, um, various oncology products are delivered in clinic and you know the idea of having clinical delivery is is not um you know completely out there but for, for psychoactive agents i think it is a little bit unusual and uh, yeah i think spravado has gone some way to sort of convincing people that, that there's merit in in this format of treatment but i'm sure 
yeah, the, the idea of, of a, a profoundly psychoactive substance with, you know, psychotherapy uh, requirements is, is probably a little bit unusual. And, you know, until, uh, until there's developments there and people can see that it is viable, I, I think um, a lot of the bigger pharma players will sit on the sidelines. And this is also why I think um, the development of, of new chemical entities that are, um, you know, without psychedelic effect or have a, a quite a different subjective profile will be increasingly attractive to, to pharma groups. Um, you kind of sidestep that whole issue of, of you know yeah. profound psychedelic activity, you know intense subjective effects, and and this need for clinical delivery with psychotherapists, um, you know, in a really hands-on way. Yeah, it becomes a model that they uh, they they better understand. Their yeah, behavior. exactly. Um, I mean, it may also be ind- indicative of just the difficulties that the the biotech sector has gone through, um, which I wanted to touch on. You know, it's. In particular, for psychedelics, it's been 2023 was a very challenging year, as you know. I think, according to Psychedel- Psychedelic Alpha, there was 296 million in capital inflows into public and private companies. That was down 41 percent from 2022 and down 84 percent from the highs of 2021. Um, you know, very few financing events. Uh, no Series B, Series C financing in 2023. Um, it would appear that, you know, there's been a bit of an uptick in biotech more broadly, a couple of big IPOs recently, you know, what are your expectations for what, um, 2024 looks like for, you know, biotech broadly, but, but more specifically for, uh, the psychedelics sector, obviously a number of companies sort of running out of uh, runway and, and desperate for cash in order to maintain their development programs. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the, um, psychedelic. Uh, companies were, were particularly hard hit by these sort of broader uh, macroeconomic events. Um, yeah, one, one of the things about biotech generally is that it's just um, extremely volatile. So um, if, if you look at indices like like the XBI, um, you know, I think it's it's sort of outperformed the S&P 500 overall um, when you look at, at long timelines. But, you know, the, the sort of upticks and, and, and the swings back down are much larger than, than for some other indexes. So, um, yeah, I think psychedelics companies were hit particularly hard. It wasn't unique. Um, they were hit harder than, than other sort of companies within the biotech sector broadly, but the entire bio, biotech sector was also um, pretty hammered from, from these the general macro environment. Um, I, I think there's sort of good indicators um, from the end of last year that, um, you know, things are sort of reversing. So I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic that we will see um, a lot more activity um, in, in 2024 and beyond um, for, for those companies, at least, that can sort of weather the current storm. But yeah, I think you're probably likely to see you know, Otsuka's acquisition of Mindset was at a, um, you know, a, a pretty good price for Otsuka, I'm sure. And, and I think you'll see a lot more of this sort of consolidation in the sector, um, you know, especially for some of the sort of mid-sized players who, who are probably, you know, approaching some pretty tight runways. Yeah, I think the uh, Otsuka deal was they paid, what, 60 million US for, uh, for Mindset Pharma, if I remember correctly. You think that's part of the story here? You think maybe some of it's been, been valuations? Obviously, valuations have come down for um, for the, the public companies significantly, but do you think some of the, the, the private companies maybe are, are still a little bit overvalued and that's, you know, driving some of the difficulties here or, or again, is it these broader macro factors that, that, you know, have been affecting biotech sort of broadly? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on the topic, but it definitely seems to be to me uh, more sort of macroeconomic um, yeah. issues than, than anything specific to, to biotech or to psychedelics. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident that will reverse uh, this year and, and next year. Uh, obviously, there'd be be fewer companies operating in the space at the end of uh, 2024, presumably. Um, you know, I yep. think we've, we've seen we've seen some very public deaths, and I'm sure there's a lot of quiet deaths taking place uh, on, on the private side. Yep. Um, you know, uh, as you know, my my uh, this is not this is not my. Uh, full-time job. It's not even a job. Uh, uh, my, my, my work is in the communication space. Uh, my company provides communications advice to uh, companies oper- and organizations operating in neuropsychiatry and mental health. So I wanted to ask you a, a communications related question, because this is uh, obviously uh, an area of interest for me, given, given what uh, me and my colleagues at my firm do. Um, we've seen um, many players in the space, you know, uh, quietly repositioning themselves from psychedelics companies to you know biotech uh pharma companies with little at all little mention at all of of uh, psychedelics in their public communications you guys are very much still positioned as a psychedelics company 
Um, you know, one just needs to look at your website and, and uh, other communications materials. Uh, your name obviously uh, has a very uh, psychedelic focus. Uh, I'm just wondering sort of, you know, has that been an intentional choice? Is that uh, a historic sort of situation where you, you know, position yourselves early as psychedelic inspired and, and have chosen to stay with that positioning? Um, any sort of uh, um, reasoning behind maintaining that position when so many others are, are changing direction, presumably given some of the things we talked about in terms of, uh, you know, pharma uh, industry interest and investor interest uh, in the space? Yeah, it's a, a really timely question because it's something that we discuss uh, quite frequently at Silo. So, yeah, the company's you know a little over two and a half years old. Um, when we started the company, um, we we needed a name to to enter an accelerator program in Australia. Um, you know, the Startmate Accelerator, which is sort of like um, Australia, New Zealand's Y Combinator. Um, so we were positioned as, as a psychedelics company because that was sort of right at the peak of um, the psychedelic hype cycle. Um, we were raising from a number of, um, you know, angel investors, family offices, um, sort of tech bio and deep tech, deep tech type inv investors in Australia, um, and obviously there was a lot of a lot of buzz around psychedelics at that time. Um, the idea of going to sort of corporate VC or even, um, you know, speaking to other serious biotech investors in this area that that wasn't even a, a possibility. I would say sort of two years ago, you know, there was no one taking a serious look um, on the biotech side at at um, psychedelics companies. Although from day one, we've always thought of ourselves as a, a biotech company. So, you know, we develop new chemical entities. We're not um, putting IP wrappers around natural products or anything else like that. Um, so, yeah, we, we do think of ourselves as a, a serious biotech company, and, and that's how we operate. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions recently about the appropriate time for sort of pivoting, you know, potentially into a different name, but um, definitely changing the sort of um, the sort of you know, website, for example, as a start and, and just the way that we're sort of um, branded and, and communicating ourselves to the broader world. Um, so yeah, it's a very timely question and something we, we, we think about quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly been a, a, a focus or rather a challenge for a number of companies as they've been looking to to sort of broader biotech investors, right? Um, you know, the, the, the many of the the uh, psychedelic VCs seem to be a bit tapped out or having difficulty, you know, raising their 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 latest uh, closing their latest rounds, and and people are having to fish elsewhere, and and I think that seems to be driving a lot of this repositioning and refocus, and and you know the the lack of of hype on psychedelics these days versus a couple of years ago. So it's a it's been interesting to watch. Um, uh, given you're an Australian, I know you're not based in Australia, but given you're an Australian, I wanted to get your take on. On the TGA, TGA uh, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, for folks that uh, don't know that acronym, their decision to reschedule or downschedule rather uh, psilocybin for treatment resistant depression and MDMA for uh, PTSD. Uh, any thoughts on how that's going in terms of the rollout? Obviously, as of July 1 last year, um, authorized prescribers could uh, prescribe those therapies. I don't know if anybody's in fact received treatments in uh, Australia at this point, I should be following this more closely. Uh, I'd written something about the down scheduling at the time, but you know, your thoughts on, on the approach that's being taken there and, and the likely impact is to have in Australia with regard to, to those patient populations. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it kind of caught everyone by surprise. So, um, yeah, for, for those who are not aware that the TGA is, um, it's our medical regulator in Australia, um, equivalent to the FDA in, in the U S or EMA in Europe. Um, and yeah, this, this decision kind of caught everyone by surprise. So Australia is quite a conservative place. We often look to the FDA or the MA for our approvals and, and we don't always even agree with those approvals. Um, so yeah, historically, you know, thalidomide was not, not approved in Australia, even though it was approved uh, in the US. Um, so, so we're a pretty conservative medical regulator, I, I would say. Um, so this decision to suddenly, uh, and without much uh, fanfare or, or consultation with experts, it seems, just announced that um, psilocybin specifically for the treatment of um, major depressive disorder and, and MDMA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder would move these substances from their current Schedule 9, which is sort of a, equivalent to a US Schedule 1, um, you know, risk of abuse, no accepted medical utility, all, all of the usual statements, um, down to Schedule 8, which is a, a pretty standard um you know, prescribing category for things like psychostimulants for ADHD. Um, so, so I had a number of sort of colleagues who were working in, in clinical trials at various hospitals in Australia with these substances, um, psychiatrists, kind of everyone in, in the medical sector. I think everyone was caught a little bit by surprise. I mean, there was no no advance warning that this was even up for consideration and then it was announced. Um, so there's, there's a need now to sort of close this gap between um, lack of sort of 
you know, sufficient forethought on how these will actually be deployed um, with the legislative change that's, that's taken place. Um, so, yeah, I know there are a number of sort of uh, private clinics who are looking to to seek authorized prescriber um, status to be able to prescribe these things. Um, there is a publicly traded company, Amiria, in Australia that um, now has authorized prescriber status. Um, and I believe the first doses, uh, I'm trying to remember um, who it was that was prescribing them, but uh, there's sort of a, a photo going around LinkedIn and elsewhere of the very first handwritten um, psychiatrist group for MDMA for PTSD, which is a, a bit of a sort of monumental moment in um, in the history of, of this field. So um, yeah, I believe people have been dosed with the first psychiatrist prescribed MDMA for PTSD at least, um, but it seems like it's sort of picking up picking up pace at the moment. But yeah, there was certainly a lot of um, a lot of hand wringing and sort of concern around how this would actually work in practice um, shortly after that announcement. I understand that, uh, and this may have changed, but you know, last time I, I uh, was looking at this, I understand that the the bar is actually quite high to become an authorized prescriber. That you actually have to have participated in a in a session uh, previously, which would mean you'd have to have participated in a in a clinical trial. And there's not very many clinical trials going on in Australia. Do you know if if that status has changed? If they've sort of uh, changed the criteria at this point for becoming an authorized prescriber, or or how that's likely likely to play out? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, um, I'm not uh, fully aware of all the details of what's required to become an authorized prescriber. Um, I, I know that yeah, it is. It's not a trivial thing. It's not like um, anyone can become an authorized prescriber. Um, I think you must be a member of the college. You know, a practicing psychiatrist. Um, I'm not sure if you have to have used the substances before, but um, you have to have submitted, um, you know, an ethics application that's been approved for use of these substances. So it is it is quite a high bar. And I'm told that um, between sort of, you know, two states, New South Wales and Victoria, where a lot of the activity is happening, um, there are literally just a handful of people who who now have been um, admitted as authorised prescribers. So certainly not um, not a floodgate that, that's opened up there. Um, and that was a lot of the, the early public commentary as well. People thought that, you know, as of July 1, they were going to turn up to their their uh, general practitioner's office yeah. and be able to get MDMA right there on the spot. And and I think, you know, we're still a very long way away from that happening. I think it's going to be pretty restricted access, um, it, you know, to, to your earlier questions about sort of rollout. Um, you know, these are currently only going to be available, um, you know, through patients who are privately insured. It's looking like the cost for a treatment program uh, for MDMA at least will be sort of 15,000 to 30,000 Australian dollars. Um, so, the, you know, these are very expensive treatments that are definitely not going to be broadly available to, to every person who's seeking them. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly on, on the authorized prescriber front, you know, you know, it, 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 it should be a fairly high bar, uh, uh, but not too high a bar, right? I mean, I think it's probably a, a matter of, of balance. Um, I know it's not a medical regime, but, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoken about previously on a panel at a conference about Oregon, where um, in order to give somebody psilocybin, you need a uh, high school education and 120 hours of training. And uh, that pales in comparison in terms of license requirements in the state of Oregon to become a hairdresser or a <laughs> funeral service provider, um, which seems uh, somewhat shocking given, um, given the respective, uh, you know, risks around uh, those various professions. Um, but uh, maybe we'll leave that topic for uh, another <laughs> Another podcast. Yeah. A, a pretty um, bad haircut can be, be pretty devastating. <laughs> <laughs> it's it certainly it certainly can. Um, what do you one one final question before we go? You know, what do you what do you think the world looks like when it comes to psychedelic medicine in in ten years time? I know that's a long uh, time frame, but drug development is a long process. Um, you know, how do you think things are likely to evolve, and and where do you think we're we're likely to be in terms of you know, patients having access to, to, to various treatments, whether they're, you know, Gen 1, Gen 2, or Gen 3, or some combination of, of the three. Yeah, I, I think at the, you know, looking first at the sort of more serious biotech end of things, and, and specifically the non-hallucinogenic agents, um, you know, you will have uh, a number of companies that are developing these things, Silo included, advancing through the necessary clinical trials. And, you know, clinical trials take quite a time, uh, quite a long time to, um, to run and, and to report. Um, but within 10 years, you should have, um, you know, pending success in phase two for a number of these different substances, um, some of these things reaching uh, marketing approval. And, and, you know, I think they'll be beyond whatever specific indications are being investigated. If the underlying sort of neurobiological hypotheses hold true, um, you'll see sort of expanded off-label use of these things for a number of different psychiatric and, and neurological indications, I believe. As with, as um, with ketamine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, um, 
you know, at the more sort of fully psychedelic end of things, besides, you know, FDA approval of, um, of compasses um, therapy, you know, Lycos and, and approval of um, MDMA for PTSD, I think that's going to change the sort of um, social mores around these substances. And, and looking again to sort of Oregon and Colorado and thinking back a little ways to, to what happened with cannabis, or these, I believe these are quite different sort of categories of, of medicinal products. Um, but we can sort of look at what happened with cannabis. And I think it's 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 not an either or kind of situation for all these people who are worried about the corporatization of, of psychedelics. I think once, you know, say Compass receives approval, marketing approval for their psilocybin treatment, um, I think a number of states who've uh, initiated, um, you know, their own sort of state level frameworks for, for using these substances for medical treatment um, will have those available to various patients as well. And, and this is sort of exactly what we saw with cannabis. So, you know, you have, um, you have, FDA approved um, solutions of, of THC that are available for different indications. You have CBD as, as epidiolex for um, for Dravet syndrome and for Lennox Gastaut, these pediatric epilepsies. But that doesn't stop uh, patients in various states from accessing uh, state regulated CBD products for, for treating their child with epilepsy, for example, if they want. Um, so I think we'll see a similar sort of thing with psychedelics where you'll have FDA approved products that are maybe not so accessible for everyone or, or are not as um, reimbursable as, as people would like. And I think in parallel to that, you'll also have probably more options available for, for other patients, both medical and non-medical because of that sort of uh, shifted social acceptance of these substances. So I think there'll be you know, many more options available at sort of all levels and, and for all um, types of patients and even recreational consumers than, than we have today. You see any big risks, risks along the way? Anything, you know, people have talked, uh, you know, uh, Roland Griffiths and others have, have written about the, the hype cycle and some of the risks of the, you know, the uh, great amount of positive attention that psychedelics have gotten in mainstream media over the last few years, much of it driven by, you know, various evangelists in the space. Um, anything that worries you going forward in terms of how the space is developing and uh, how we're bringing these drugs to market as, as potential medicines? Yeah, I, I think the this sort of unbridled enthusiasm, um, you know, ne needs a bit of a sense check. And I think people should be sort of cautious in the language they use. And it's um, it's funny to hear Michael Pollan now talking about um, how these things should be rolled out with some restraint after, you know, writing a book and then making a documentary about how they're essentially panaceas. So I, I, I think the communication um, to, to patients in this space um, needs to be done very carefully. Like the, these are not substances that are without risk. There are, are plenty of patients who can have very serious um, adverse events from, from psychedelics. Um, and some of these can be persistent and, and quite problematic, more problematic than whatever disease they're seeking to treat. Um, and they're sort of early, early indicators that patients already have this enormous amount of expectation. So if you take someone that's, um, you know, been diagnosed, say, with treatment-resistant depression, you know, they've read a newspaper article about how psilocybin is, is absolutely transformative. Their expectation for that being sort of a miracle cure um, is so high that that if it's not a cure um, for that person or a successful treatment, um, they may actually be in a much worse position psychologically than, than when they entered treatment. So, yeah, I don't think there's much physical risk necessarily with psychedelics, but I think there is an enormous sort of, um, you know, psychological and psychiatric risk with these substances. And I think, yeah, caution is warranted both around expectation uh, and around just, uh, you know, how these are actually being used in, in a clinical sense. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the points I made when I was uh, speaking on this panel about Oregon is the fact that, you know, for somebody who has gone through every potential treatment, who has failed and, and thinks psychedelics are going to work, um, you know, they, they, they're they going to fall off a cliff potentially when, if and when the treatment doesn't work. And there's not necessarily anybody to catch them when you've got somebody with, you know, a high school diploma and 20, 120 hours of training. Although many of the people who presumably will seek um, licenses as service providers will have you know, backgrounds in, in, in therapy and, and, and will be, uh, pro uh, uh, professionals from, from the medical profession, but, uh, but it certainly is a big risk and there have been a lack of, of, of voices out there, I think over the last number of years about the potential risks and, and the fact that these are not going to be, uh, uh, treatments that are going to work for everybody and for every indication. Mm -hmm. um, this has been right. reported by some people in some of the trials, right? So um, people who were who voluntarily withdrew from some of the early psychedelics trials um, or were excluded partway through the trial for various reasons. Um, some of these people have spoken, these, these patients have spoken very publicly about um, the fact that they didn't really feel there was this, uh, appropriate sort of aftercare for their situation. They're sort of, um, you know, it's, it's a bad metaphor, but uh, analogy, but sort of, you know, dumped out on the street without really much um, follow-up care. Um, so I think that's that's a bit of a risk as well, um, more so for for clinical trials. Um, hopefully, by the time these things are being 
um, more widely prescribed and, and used, um, you know, some of these things have been considered and there's appropriate measures in place. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, listen, uh, thanks for your time today. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast and I uh, hope we get you uh, back again um, uh, at some point in the future as uh, things uh, develop further for Silo and you uh, you move along in the, the drug development path and uh, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see uh, what the future holds. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, really great speaking with you.